My name is Pastor Jen, for those of you who may not know who I am, and I'm just excited because we are getting ready to jump into the Word of God. Uh, Pastor wanted me to let you know where he is because he was like, I don't want people to think I'm out sick. He's actually on assignment across the street, so that's where I'm coming from. He is preaching right now at House of Revival, Casa de Avivamiento, across the street. They invited him as a surprise to their pastor as they're honoring him today. So we are both on assignment at the same time, but all is well. That is where he is. Today we're kicking off a brand new series called Financial Atheist. <laughs> we are debunking the myths that surround God and money. And so today I want to come from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 and then we'll skip down to verses 7 and 8. So let's go ahead and jump into the word of God. Here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 8 starting at verse 1 says. It says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us, jumping down to verse 7. But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. I want to speak to all of us this morning from the topic rooted in love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your goodness and your power. We are grateful, God, already because we know that you are going to speak to our hearts and send the word that we need to hear in this season and in this hour. So we thank you, God, for what you've done already in this service. And we are grateful for what you're getting ready to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and take your seats. Mm, financial atheist. Some people are like, how are you a financial atheist? And we do a giving series every year in November at this church because sometimes pastors, uh, especially in this uh, culture and society, have been made to feel like they shouldn't talk about money, they shouldn't bring money up, uh, but actually Jesus himself brings up money so many times in the word of God. And so as I thought about getting this message together, I said, God, where do we start? It's the first sermon of this series. And he said he wanted me to start with the foundation, the foundation of uh, financial generosity. What is it that causes people to be financially generous? And I thought about, you know, God, you're asking me to lay the foundation for financial generosity. But sometimes I feel like parents born before 1960 were not financially generous. You want to know why? Because when I was growing up, you would say, I would say to one of my parents, can we stop and get some McDonald's? And my mom would say, do you have, do you have McDonald's money? She's born before 1960. I would then sometimes say, mom, can we go to Subway? And she was like, what do you want to go to Subway for? And I'm like, to get a sub. And she would say, girl, we have bread at home. We have cold cuts at home. We have cheese, lettuce, and tomato. She's like, there's nothing at Subway that I don't already have in my refrigerator. And I'm like, well, they have a certain type of bread at Subway. They're going to put on the right amount of mayo. They're going to shred my lettuce. She's not going to shred my lettuce for me. Right? So I'm like, maybe, maybe there's something about parents born before 1960. Be, well, then, then, but then I guess that's not true. Because when my kids are like, mom, where are we going for dinner after church today? I'm like, we're going to 5151, I already cooked. We're going to our crock pot for dinner. We're going to what I made last night in the sto on the stove or in the oven for dinner. And I realized that even though, oh, here's one last one that just came to me. How many of you grew up in situations where if you were going to a, an amusement park or a theme park, your mom, your aunt, your uncle, somebody was packing food in a cooler, 
to go and eat it in the car. You, your family was not getting those $10 chicken tenders. Because those $10 chicken tenders don't come with fries, they don't come with a drink, and you grow up in a household where they said, I have chicken tenders in my cooler. Can't nobody fry chicken like me anyway. So you know how much chicken I can fry for $10? Some families are not letting go of money. And so I thought about how we laugh about it in those instances, but the reality is when it comes to money, money is something that is hard for a lot of people to let go of. The thing about money is that money is powerful. It can actually ruin friendships and family relationships. Money is the thing that Sometimes we say, hey, it makes the world go round. The Bible even says that money answers all things. But on the same token, the Bible also says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And a lot of evil that we see in the world, such as human trafficking and other heinous things, are a result of people loving money more than they love people. You've probably heard the phrase that we are supposed to love people and use money. But some people love money and use people. And so God comes to us today and he is reminding us that as a Christian, we should be generous. Interestingly enough, my husband and I have spoken to Christians and it's nobody that, it's not Christians that go to lengths. So please don't look at your neighbor when I give this example so you can turn around and be like, oh, is that you? Okay. Um, kind of like when Judas was like, is it me? The, you know, so you don't have to look and be like, are you Judas? No. But we have spoken to Christians who have actually said, when I go to church, I only will tithe my time. I won't tithe my money because the church doesn't need my money. So someone told us, at my church, I tithe my time. I try to give 10% of the hours that I work at my job to my church, but the church doesn't need my money. And we quickly said to them, I think your pastor would beg to differ. Because believe it or not, I know this is getting ready to shock some of you and blow your minds, but the electricity at churches is not free. It's a sh I know it's a shock. The water isn't free here. The equipment isn't free. The, the, the link kids materials, okay. Tequila, they're not ready for this. The Link Kids materials that we buy, we have to pay for them. <laughs> when we go to the store and say, Jesus paid it all, they're like, he didn't pay for these crayons. He didn't pay for this construction paper. It's not free. And so what happens is, is that people struggle to give away money. But I often have found through not only examples in the Bible, but examples in real life that it's often the people who have less to work with tend to be the ones who give the most. Years ago, my husband and I were introduced to a family from Liberia by a mutual friend. And at the time that we were getting ready to meet this couple, they had literally just stepped off of the plane uh, from Liberia within days of us meeting them. And at the time, they had really nothing to their name they were here because the husband had gotten a full ride to Princeton Theological Seminary. And so they were here, but they really didn't have anything to their name. School was paying for everything. And so because we had this background information on them, we decided that we were gonna go in and see how we could bless them, how we could take care of them. What could we do to make them feel welcome? What could we do to make them feel like uh, they've got somebody in their corner? And when we got there, I could smell the aroma of West African food. If you've not had West African food, you've not eaten. You, and some of you are like, well, I've had Italian food. Okay, but that doesn't equate to West African food. And so I smell the aroma and everything smells delicious. And we were shocked because we knew they didn't have much. And yet when, we, when they opened the door, the wife said, I cooked for you as much as I could. Wasn't a whole lot, but yet, even though it wasn't a lot, she also said, and we want you to eat as much as you want until you're full. She knew that by saying that, if we were the type of people that were greedy and were going to clear them out, it would leave them probably with not much. But they were willing to let go of it because they felt like, well, 
We'll let it go, we can get it back again. What about the widow that the Bible talks about, the widow's might, where Jesus is seeing people put money into the treasury, and then this widow gives two mites. She gives her two coins, and Jesus says she actually has given more than anybody else has given that day. Why? Because the other people who gave, gave out of abundance. They gave out of knowing when they give this offering, there's still some money left in their checking account. When they give this offering, there's still some money left in their savings account. But this woman gave all that was left that she had to her name. <coughs> so she gave more because of her heart posture. She gave more because she was willing to sacrifice everything that she had. And so now... We get to the passage of scripture that we read this morning where Paul is actually talking to the Corinthians about the saints or the church in Macedonia. Macedonia would be located in the region of northern Greece and he's telling them some things that I find interesting. Paul says that the saints of Macedonia are poor and they are giving out of their great affliction and their poverty. He says that they give according to their means, but they also give above their means. So we see in verses uh, 1 through 5 how Paul starts to break this down. When he says that they give according to their means, he's letting the Corinthians know that the saints in Macedonia have not given a great amount financially, but they have given all that they could give, but they've given above their means, and above their means here is their heart posture. He's saying that they've actually given more than anyone because their heart was to give everything they had. Their heart was to sacrifice for the kingdom. Their heart was to give everything they could for the kingdom. And and then Paul says later on, which we'll talk about, that the reason why they're able to do this is because of the love that they have. The love that they have for God, the love that they have for the kingdom. And so I want you to know today that if you find that you are stingy, if you find that you are tight-fisted, if you find that you are unwilling to give to God and his kingdom, you are a financial atheist. You may not be a full-blown atheist because you believe in God and you believe that there is a God, but you're a financial atheist because you don't believe if you sow into the kingdom that you'll get anything in return. You don't believe that if you give to God, he'll give you more than you have room to receive. You think you can actually beat God giving. You cannot beat God giving. There's a song they used to sing when I was growing up where the words actually said, you can't beat God giving no matter how you try because they were trying to remind you that it doesn't matter if you give God the last of your possessions. He can do you one better than that. But an atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. So if you don't believe that you should give, that you can give, or that God wants you to give, you then become a financial atheist. That's good. So interestingly enough, the saints in Macedonia are poor. Why are they poor? The Romans, when they conquered them, had taken much of their wealth. But here's what's also interesting about what Paul says about them. He says, in one version, that they insisted that they give. That's what it says in the Amplified Version. As you're reading verses 1 through 5, Paul says they're insisting that they give. They're insisting that they give an offering. They're insisting that I take their money. When is the last time you insisted that God take your money? When was the last time you insisted, God, please open up more doors for me to give. Open up more ways for me to give. Open up more opportunities for me to give. Most of us have asked God for money recently. Maybe just this morning you asked God for more money. But when was the last time you begged him for more money so that you could impact the kingdom? When was the last time you asked him for more money so you could advance the kingdom? When was the last time you asked him for more money so that people who have not yet heard the gospel could be saved? We recently as a family went to this museum in Waxhaw. I believe it's Waxhaw. It's called the Alphabet Museum. And so you may think it's all about ABCs and 123s, but it's not. It's all about the history of language, the history of 
how certain languages got started, or where certain languages originated. And it's run by a faith-based group, and this faith-based group, the, the founders and those who work in it now are committed to taking funds and making sure that the Bible is translated into every known language on the earth. So when you go there, at the end of all of the exhibits, they will tell you how many Bibles they've been able to translate so far in terms of languages and how many more languages are left to go. And they tell you how your church can partner or how you can partner as an individual. And some of us may not be blessed because the same God that we're saying, uh, God, I need you to give me more financially, is the same God we're not prepared to give to. Do you know the Bible says that the liberal soul shall be made fat? Not the stingy soul. <laughs> when you're tight-fisted, you're not made fat because God's thing is, why would I give you more when what you do have you won't let go of? The liberal soul is made fat because the liberal soul has already shown God, you have blessed me financially. Whatever I have, I will give. Their hands are open. They're in a position to receive. Sometimes in church, Pastors are made to feel like they should be mute on the subject of finances, but we cannot be mute because God does care about finances. You know why? Because your level of giving is equated to your level of love. You cannot say you love God and you never give his house anything. How do you never invest in the thing you say you love? God I love you and I thank you for my job, but I'm not giving you a tenth of my salary. Or God, I'll give you some of it. So God, if you bless me with this job that makes 5,000 a month, I promise I'll give you five to 10 of it, meaning dollars a month. A tithe is a tenth. You're saying, but PJ, I do love God. Don't you usually invest and in sow into the things that you love? Some of us have stock in other places, but we have no stock in the kingdom of God. You're putting your stock in Spectrum, Verizon, AT&T, Disney, and all these other places. How do you have stock in places, but you don't have stock in the kingdom? PJ, I have stock in the kingdom. If you don't give, you don't have any stock. You will not get a return on what you have not invested. You don't have stock in the kingdom. If you're not a giver, you don't have stock. God does not hate you. God is not going to just cause all these terrible things to happen to you because he's mean and vindictive, but he wants you to know that you actually don't have the stock that you think you have in his kingdom. So they beg Paul, please take our offering. They're begging to give. And then in verse 5, it says, And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. This is letting us know that you are not going to be able to be a financial generous person if you're not first given over to God. The church at Macedonia was able to be financially generous because they were first given over to God, Paul says, then to us, meaning because their hearts were already postured to give God everything that they had, God then laid on their hearts how to give and how to serve, how to sow. Do you know that there is a grace that you have to ask God in order to be financially generous? You have to ask God for that grace. Most human beings are not going to come wired wanting to just throw their money at something. Not even the kingdom of God. People who will sit down, we know of a pastor right in this state who says there's a couple in his church. They're wealthy, they have an estate, but they give, even according to their wealth, they give in a way that he sometimes is almost like, are you sure you want to write that much for your check? That's a grace on their life. That is not them being wired. They're not better humans than you, but they have a grace to give. You have to ask God for the grace to give. If you find that you are tight-fisted, if you find that you are hard-pressed to want to give, 
If you find that you do some introspection and you see that you're not generous, you actually need to pray the prayer. God, give me a heart like the Macedonian church. Give me a heart that is first turned over to you so that then I can turn myself over to the kingdom. God, give me the grace to give. Give me the power to give. Give me the strength to give because I promise on your own you won't do it. Some people have the mindset, when I get more, I will give more. That's not how it works because your heart posture will be the same. The heart posture is how you give. That's why your generosity is rooted in your love. If you don't love God enough to give him the best you can where you are now, you will not give him more just because you've gotten more. You will find other ways to put your money just like you're finding other ways to put it now. But the person with the heart posture that says, God, I don't even make as much as others, but my heart posture is I love you and your kingdom so much. I love the gospel so much. I want the kingdom to advance so much that I will give the best that I possibly can at my level. That is the one that is in position for God to give them more. But they're also a person that actually believes that if they give to God, he will not leave them hanging. Do you know that it is actually a privilege to give to the kingdom of God? The reason why giving is a privilege and not a, or shouldn't be a chore, is because the kingdom of God is the only place where you can sow financially and you will never have a deficit. It's the only kingdom where you can serve financially and you'll never be put to shame. The only kingdom where you can sow financially and you'll never regret a payment that you made. You can sow into the stock market and you'll end up embarrassed. You can sow into the stock market and you'll end up with egg on your face. Why? Because sometimes things happen. Stock markets crash. Companies go down. People mishandle your money. But God will never mishandle your money. If you give to God the best you can, God will do his absolute best for you. You will never come to shame. You will never come to poverty. You will never come to lack. And you may not have all that you want, but you will always have all that you need. You will not beg. The Bible says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Guess what? If you sow into the kingdom of God, you are part of his righteousness. And then that means you will not be forsaken. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, they will never beg for bread. They will never go hungry. They may not every always have what they want when they want it, but they will never suffer lack. They will never come to ruin. But it's for the righteous. It's not just, the Bible doesn't just say, I've never seen those who believe that there is a God forsaken nor has, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. And your righteousness is not just about how many tongues in which you can speak. (laughs) Your righteousness is not just about how you dress. Your righteousness is not just about all of the hymns that you know. And thank God, because some people in this generation coming after me don't know any hymns. So if it was relegated to the amount of hymns, you know, you wouldn't be righteous, Gen Z. Okay. I love Gen Z, so don't go home offended, y'all. But in all honesty, I do believe that righteous people are righteous, not just in some of the other things that we talk about, but they're righteous in their giving. So giving comes as a result of your love for God. We talked about giving money being a grace that comes from God. And you know why it's a grace also? Because I think Ose can corroborate with me on this, but there are people out there. And you think, oh my gosh, they're so generous. Look how much they give to all these organizations every year. They give that much because of tax purposes. There there are some people that, yes, they're wealthy and they're generous. I'm not saying no wealthy people are generous, meaning people that are like extremely wealthy. But a lot of wealthy people are giving because they just don't want to be taxed. So they need to give to these organizations for a tax write-off. That's how you know it has to come with a grace. They're they're giving more so because if they don't, they're actually going to spend even more 
than just go ahead and sowing into organizations. By the way, if you're one of those people we're trying to build or purchase a new building, you too. Oh, say will gladly make sure that you get your tax right off. So I am throwing it out there. If you're secretly wealthy, if you're a next door billionaire, you can write a check today. At Two Link Church and Osei will see to it that you get that tax right off. But it takes a grace to say, I'm giving just because I want to give. I'm giving just because I want to see the kingdom advance. I'm giving whether I get a tax right off or not. Now here's the other thing that proves to us that our giving comes as being rooted in love. When we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 8, listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. He's talking about their giving. Then he says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. So what's happening here is the church at Corinth is starting to back up a little bit as to whether or not they're going to give an offering to Paul for the saints that are in Jerusalem. And Paul is like, you're excelling in everything else. I need you to excel in this also. And he says, because if you excel in your giving, I'll be able to talk basically about you as I do the Macedonian church. And I'll be able to say, these people are full of love because look at how they give. But interestingly, Paul says, I say this not as a command. Why do we not command you at Link Church to give your tithes? We encourage you. We don't command you. Why do we not command you to give an offering? We ask you to. We encourage you, but we don't command you. You know why we don't command you? Because if we command you to give your offering and you give it, it's just taxation. It's just a bill. But we are not a company that is sending you a bill. We don't command it because God is not after you viewing it as if you're paying a bill. He's asking you to view it as in, God, you have given me so much. How can I not give back out of what you have given to me? That's why pastor always says, we're not necessarily after your money more than we are after your heart. Because we know that where your heart is, what does the Bible say? That, uh-oh. Oh, Oh, okay. Woo. I was about to say, like, wait a minute now. Not all this word coming from this pulpit and you're like, wherever your heart is is where you're... Uh, yeah, but y'all said treasure. Okay, so. Okay, Pastor, we're not as bad off as I was thinking for a second. Y'all were like, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. So when your pastors or somebody else on the platform says, we need you to give towards legacy offering. We need you to give your tithes. We need you to give your offering. It's not because we're doing it as a command. We're doing it because God is after your heart. It is your heart that is in relation to your giving. And you cannot say after hearing this message today that you love God with your whole heart, but you give him nothing or you give him far less than you're able to give him. God is not asking you <laughs> to go into debt to give to the kingdom. If the best you can give, let's say today the best you can give is $50, but you're like, well, PJ said I got to give more, so... I'm just going to run a credit card. No, we do not want you owing Visa in the name of, well, PJ said I had to give more. You're not supposed to be in debt, but God is saying, what's the best you can give? That widow gave the best she could give. The saints at Macedonia, Paul tells us, and he told the Corinthians, they gave the best they could give. And then guess what? God will credit to you what he credited to the Macedonians when he said that they also gave above their ability. And you're wondering, well, how did they give above their ability without going in debt? Again, it's because God is saying that because their heart was in the right place, I counted it as them giving even more than they had given physically. So if $50 is your best, but you had it in your heart to give a hundred you had it in your heart to give 30 but 50 is your absolute best 
and final for this Sunday, God will say, guess what? Oh, say you gave according to your ability, but you gave above your ability. Tiffany, you gave according to your ability, but you gave above your ability. That's your heart posture is how God will credit it to you. That's why Abraham's faith was counted to him for righteousness. Not how much he gave, not how much he sold, but his heart posture. And I guarantee you today, if you give the best you have, but your heart is where it's supposed to be, God will credit that to your account. Heaven's bank is the best bank. The best bank. Because guess what? If I pay a bill, and I say I split the, the bill in half because maybe I need to split it in half into two payments. And I say, okay, I'm going to give you guys 150 this week and another 150 the next two weeks. They're not going to say, well, you know what, Mrs. Watson, your heart's in the right place. So we're going to credit that other 150 to your account. They're going to say, perfect, we'll see you in 14 days for the other 150. But God says, your heart's in the right place? I'm going to bless you more than somebody who put 1500 in the offering because you did your absolute best. And maybe the person who gave 1500 didn't do their absolute best. And so I want you to know that your belief in God also comes out of your love for him. Because you love God so much that you'll take him at his word. That he's going to give you more. He's going to give you exceeding and abundantly above you what you could ask or what you're even able to think. But your heart has to first believe that God is not a God that is just looking to take your money and leave you destitute. Why do you trust the stock market more than you trust the Savior? The amount of people that let Bernie Madoff handle their money and some of those same people, if Christ had said, I want you to give me all of that, whoa, Lord, that's too much. There is a pastor in Texas. I believe his name is Robert Morrison. He has given away houses because he says that he literally was sitting in one of his houses one day years ago, and God said, I want you to give this house away. He was like, devil, you are not. My sheep hear my voice, and that Lord can't be. That can't be your voice. Because he was like, it wasn't like it was a rundown house, right? Because then he might have been like, oh, okay. It was an amazing house. And he said he's sitting in his house one day, and God says, give this house away. Don't charge the person for it. Don't say, well, I will sell it to you for less than what I got it for or less than what it's worth. He said, give it to them. He has given away more than one house. He's given away cars. He's giving away money. You know why? Because some people's heart posture is, well, if I give away this house, what on earth does God have for me next? You know what a faith-based business coach told me one time? He said that when he comes across believers who don't want to give away their money or sow their funds, he says to them, how can you not give away money when your father owns a cattle on a thousand hills? When your father created and owns the universe, when you have a dad, you don't need a rich uncle, you got a rich father. Money is no object for Christ. And so he said he tells people, it's just money. Give it away, you can get some more. Give it away, you can earn some more. Give it away, God can give you some more. It's just money. He says it's just money because this particular coach is not run by money he's not ruled by money I've seen him be a giving person that's why he tells people it's just money but for some of us money is king because they say cash is king cash is not my king Jesus is my king I will not be ruled by money I will not be ruled by cash I will be ruled by the king of kings and the lord of lords Jesus is king not your cash not your check not your debit card But if you keep saying cash is king, then it's no, no wonder why cash and money rule you. Because you have said and confessed out of your own mouth, cash is my king. 
And when you have said cash is my king, that is why you are bound by money. That is why you are bound by stinginess. That is why you are bound by being tight-fisted. Because you have declared out of your own mouth who is going to rule you. But if you say cash is something that Christ uses on the earth as a currency to advance his kingdom, but I am not ruled by it, I am not surrendering my life to it, then all of a sudden you see how that pressure starts to lift. Because with cash being your king, he will tell you how to manage your money. Because your king tells you how to behave. So when your cash is your king, your king tells you hoard it for yourself. Your king tells you the church doesn't need it. Your, your king tells you you don't need to sow anywhere that has the name church in it. But when Christ is your king, you say, I cannot serve God and mammon. When Christ is your king, he says, I want you to give me a tenth. I want you to give here. I want you to give there. As a matter of fact, we're not even saying that Link Church should be the only place you should give. Ask and pray God for other organizations that you can sow into to help advance his kingdom. It's not just relegated to Link Church. But if you're not giving and you consider yourself a member, this is a good place to start. My mom used to say the church is the only place where you can go get a good meal and you don't pay for it. Because she said people will go to church Sunday after Sunday and consume and consume and eat and talk about how good the word of God was. But the minute your pastor says it's time for us to give, your hands go in your pocket. Your phone goes in your purse. You know full well if you go out to eat after church today and you told them that meal was good. I'll see you next week. Uh, no, you won't because you didn't even pay for the meal this week. Go right in that back. We have a ton of dishes you can wash. But because we don't make you wash dishes and wash microphones and vacuum carpets and clean toilets, you're like, I'm just going to come back and eat here again. Church is not a restaurant. This is the kingdom of God. So if you can pay a restaurant, you should do God one better. Yes. Yes, we are servants of God, and yes, as your pastors, we're here to serve you. But then you also have to do your part to serve. And so if you're on the squad, thank you for serving. If you're getting ready to join the squad, thank you for serving. If you come to Bible, if you come to noon Bible study, thank you for serving. If you come to prayer, thank you for serving. But at the end of the day, your serving will not pay these bills. Your serving will not build another building. It will not. But the saints in Jerusalem were able to survive because the saints at Macedonia said, we don't have much, but all we have we will give. Because little is much in the hands of the master. With If God could take two fish and five loaves to feed five, over 5,000 and have some left over, that's why they said, what little we do have, it can advance the kingdom in Jerusalem. So what little you do have can advance the kingdom in Charlotte. What little you do have can advance the kingdom in America, can advance the kingdom on, in North America and across the globe. So you've got to make a decision for yourself today and you've got to do introspection and determine, man, am I a financial atheist? Have I not been giving the best I could give all this time because I really didn't believe that God could do what he said he would do with my money? Have I been sitting and coming to church all this time thinking that I loved God more than I actually love him because I say I love him, but I hold back. Ananias and Sapphira, you know about them in the New Testament? Peter said to them when they sold their possessions, because at this time the children of God were selling their possessions and they were putting all things in common they sold possessions they come before peter and he says is this everything that you have he was just asking for their heart posture is this everything that you have and ananias says this is all i have drops dead i don't know where sapphira was because he was dead for like three hours but she comes in after him i like that i like that music y'all keep that and they say, is this all that you have from what you've sold? She says, that is all that I have. She drops dead. 
And Peter says, you know why you're dropping dead? They've dropped dead not because they kept some for themselves because they had an opportunity to tell the truth. They dropped dead because of their heart posture. They dared to lie to the Holy Spirit. So when you put in your tithes and your offering, you're not lying to me because I don't have your pay stub and I don't want your pay stub. But you will drop dead if you lie to the Holy Spirit. Not a physical death, but spiritually, things in your life are dead. Spiritually, you wonder why things aren't working out. Spiritually, you wonder why you can't seem to resurrect certain things in your life. It's because you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And you have told the Holy Spirit, I believe in you with everything that I have. And he says, you do not because you're reserving something for yourself. I've asked you to give your best and you're saying, God, this is all I have. And he knows it's not the best that you have. He knows it's not all that you have. And I know this kind of preaching is not always popular. But I'm not here to preach what's popular. I'm here to preach what's right. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to make you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That says, God, get that Ananias and Sapphira spirit up out of me. Help me not to hold back from you. Help me to give you everything that I have. I'm tired of dropping dead. I'm tired of being spiritually deceased. I'm tired of not having things in my life be resurrected simply because I won't give. Open my hand. Open my heart. Open my ears. Open my eyes. Forgive me, God, for being stingy. Forgive me for having a tight fist. But today, God, I declare that you are my king. You are my Lord. And I give myself over first to you and then to the kingdom of God. Like the saints at Macedonia, give yourself over to God first. And that is how he will give you power to give yourself over to the kingdom. Everyone can stand because I'm wrapping this up. I didn't even mean to bring up Ananias and Sapphira in today's message. It wasn't in my notes. But obviously God is saying that there is at least one person in here who may have things in their life that you know should be alive and well. That you know should be resurrected. And you've been saying, God, the devil is on my track. And God is saying, this time it's not the devil. It's your closed fist. Everything is not the devil. Some things are disobedience. Stop blaming the devil for what does not belong to him. We have a lot we can blame him for, but everything is not a demonic attack. Some of our suffering is due to disobedience, not from a demon in hell. So your financial generosity is rooted in love. And if you struggle to give, ask God to give you a heart where that part of your heart is also surrendered to him. Tell God, I don't want to be a financial atheist. I don't want to hold on to lies of the enemy that caused me to hold on to my money. I want to see the kingdom of God advance. Some people say, oh, I don't give to church because I don't know how they handle their money. Give to the church and God will handle the leaders if it's being mishandled. How about that? Stop putting trust in man. Put your trust in God. When pastor and I were not pastors, we never missed our tithes. We didn't miss an offering. Why? Because we felt like, as far as we know, the money is being handled correctly because of what we know. But if by chance it's not, God will handle them. But I'm not responsible for if they mishandle my tithes. I'm responsible if I don't give them. I'm not responsible if somebody mishandles the money that I sow into Operation Christmas Child. Franklin Graham, that one's on you if you want to mishandle my funds. But guess what? I'm not penalized if he mishandles my funds. I'm penalized if I mishandle God's funds that he has given to me. You want to get out of prison, financial prison, pay your tithes. You want to get out of financial turmoil, become a generous giver, a hilarious giver. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. So there again is proof that it's your heart posture. He doesn't want you giving out of, oh, they're telling me I have to give. He doesn't even want you giving out of what you can get. He wants you giving out of love, which is why Paul said, 
if you can just do this last thing and give generously, I'll be able to tell others that your love is genuine, the Bible says. Because your genuine love produces generous giving. Thanks for watching our service today. We hope and pray that you are encouraged. We love to give here at Link. There are two convenient ways to give to our church. You can text the number 84321 or give online at linkchurchnc.org forward slash give. Join us next week for Link Online. We pray that you have a great and blessed week.